alive with, with a no-so salvation. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us his spirit as a pledge. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you've shown us that while life is short, there is something eternal to be looked forward to. We bless you for giving us hope in Jesus. We can have forgiveness now. We can have eternal life that starts now. We know that doesn't make it easy to to step through death's door or to endure the groaning that we have to endure here in this world. But what a hope, because Jesus rose from the dead, what a hope is uh, there is for those who follow him. We'll ask that this would be a, an encouragement and a comfort to us, that we would come away from here seeing you better than we have before as a God who can comfort his people with something they, they can know for sure. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Isn't it true that in our culture, a lot of people base what goes on in any given day of their life on how they feel. A lot of biblical counselors like me would call this a feelings-based existence. It creeps into to all sorts of scenarios. Have you ever had someone who was going to ask you to do something, to take on a job, say to you, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about taking on that responsibility? And we even have churches when, when our, our primary role, if our primary role is just to get everybody cranked up and emotional, and somebody, as, as my favorite preacher Alistair Begg said, he was visiting another church, and the, the song leader got up and said, How y'all feel today? Nothing wrong with asking people how they're feeling, by the way. But isn't it true that what you know is so much more important than what you feel at any given moment? When you are looking death in the eye, is it most important that you feel good? Or is it most important that you know that you're leaving this world, if you do indeed leave this world, and stepping into an eternity that is known? Because you have a God who keeps his promises, who never fails, whose words don't fall to the ground, whose people will be saved This is the God Paul is introducing to us and and first introduced to the church at Corinth when he visited the first time. He told them, "I, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus and him crucified. So it was all cross, all gospel, all the time. And that really is what we ought to be about. In our teaching and our preaching, in our disciple making, we take people to what we can know for sure in this world. The scripture gives so many illustrations of this and the one the one that we're getting put before us right now is that of an earthly dwelling place that is temporary. Paul used that metaphor here. Peter actually when you read 2nd Peter which is his swan song before he left this world as a martyr most likely uh, Peter talked about moving out of this tabernacle this tent that we live in. If, if you have attended a, a funeral that I have officiated for believers through the years, uh, I have numerous times used an illustration that came out of a book written by Lorraine Bettner called Immortality. And he, he records an account of President John Quincy Adams. So a lot of you remember this story. I, I bring it out here because this is the text that always takes me to that story. When John Quincy Adams was 80 years old, according to the story, uh, lived in Boston, and he was walking slowly down a street, and a younger friend uh, confronted him on the street and said, and how is John Quincy Adams today? And the former president said, thank you. John Quincy Adams is well, sir. 
quite well, I thank you. Now, I, I have to tell you a little bit about John Quincy Adams. He was not a deist like a, a number of our founders were. John Quincy Adams, uh, uh, one of the founders of the American Bible Society, someone who had a love for the Lord Jesus and a, a devotion to, to orthodox theology and to the scriptures themselves. So he knew his Bible well, and, and so Quincy, John Quincy Adams said, thank you. John Quincy Adams is well, sir, quite well, I thank you, but the house in which he lives at present is becoming dilapidated. It is tottering upon the foundations. Time and the seasons have nearly destroyed it. Its roof is pretty well worn out. Its walls are shattered, and it trembles with every wind. The old tenement is becoming almost uninhabitable, and I think John Quincy Adams will have to move out of it soon. But he himself is quite well, sir, quite well. And with that, the venerable old statesman, leaning heavily on his cane, ambled slowly down that Boston street. Adams understood something that, that Solomon wrote about, moved along by the Holy Spirit in the book of Ecclesiastes, and for that matter, Proverbs gives, gives this picture too, about how short life is. James talked about life being a vapor, Paul talked about us living in a tent. Peter talked about us living in a tent. You are not your body. I realize that you're intertwined in your body. And it, it, it's a hard thing to die, honestly, when the time comes. I have known of very strong believers who weren't afraid of what came after. But stepping through that river is a, a rough thing. And yet you are not your body. You are a soul. You don't have a soul. You have a body. You are a soul. And that means there is a material part of you and an immaterial part of you. Theologians, that makes me a dichotomist. Your soul and your spirit and your mind and your heart and all of those terms for the immaterial part of you are, are something that will go on living eternally. And this is the hope that Paul is giving to believers now. As an unbeliever, knowing that you have an immaterial part that's eternal ought to scare you. Because the Bible doesn't just comfort believers with what comes after death. We have examples and words of what comes after death for someone who rejects the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And, and it's eternal fire, it's punishment, it's darkness, it's crowding. It's, it's a horrible thing. And people say, how could a God, well, I mean, what kind of God is it says, love me or you go to hell? A God who knows what is exactly the best for his creatures. So God has spoken. He's calling everyone everywhere to repent. And so when, when you've come to this place and you realize, it's not like I'm, I want to abuse my body, but the truth is, if somebody else does, or if I just am subject to decay in this world because I live in a sin-cursed world, there's something so much better waiting for me. How sweet that must have been to these first century ears. People who knew by what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, that many of the, the first auditors of this letter were going to be martyred out of the world. What hope is there for somebody who isn't a body, but who just lives in a body, who trusts in Christ who has bowed the knee to King Jesus as their master. These are the words Paul gives as a comfort to us. For we know, there it is, not we feel. So, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good about this. We know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. There's a confidence, saints, that you have a no-so salvation. And that's not because you mouth the words of a prayer after a, a teacher or a preacher or a parent. This is someone who has done more than, than made a claim. Confessing Jesus as Lord is a, a life change that may or may, not, may or may not start with words coming out of your mouth. Faith is confidence in what God has said. That's how you know things. I say, God said it. And I don't even have to believe it. it. It settles it if God said it. I'm telling you, this is more than just a privately held opinion that holds no risk. 
people say, well, you know, you've got your truth, I've got my truth, and for me, Jesus is Lord. That's not faith. There is a risk in saying I'm staking my eternal destiny on this truth. That it's the only truth. That's the only hope for the people in my family, whether it's my children or my nieces and nephews or my brothers and my sisters or my parents, the, the people who work with me, people for whom I work or who work under me. Paul's talking about a confidence here that, that our house, our tent, when it's torn down, we have a building from God and it's, it's a house that isn't made with human hands. It's eternal in the heavens. And that means if you believe this, it transforms the very reason you live and die. It, I mean, that's, that's it. If the persecution really were to heat up in the United States, I'm not predicting that, but there's a lot of weird stuff going on around us, right? If the persecution heats up in our country where eventually in places it, it became illegal to follow Christ like it's illegal in some parts of the world to meet on Sundays now, This confidence, not, not our political affiliation, this confidence is ours and it, it changes the way we live and the reason we live. So he calls our earthly bodies tents and it really underscores what? How short life is. Not, a, not again, a, a privately held opinion, but a confidence that, that this is what God has said about us. Tents are not designed to be permanent. Usually every year I, I spend some time and my family knows how much I, I, I just relish camping trips. And they're laughing over to my side. I'm not, I'm not a big camper. Uh, and, and a lot of that has to do not with, I mean, I like getting up early in the morning and making coffee and smelling uh, the fresh air at Gooseberry Falls at Lake Superior. I, I like that kind of part. But there's just a lot of other stuff. Maybe the biggest thing is I'm kind of a big guy and sleeping on the ground doesn't always work real well for me. And so I have become convinced, even though my family doesn't necessarily agree with this, and I will take you camping this summer, but one of the best parts for me of camping is it makes you long for home. And that's the, tents were never made to be permanent dwellings, even though you look through history, there were nomadic peoples and that, that was it. And yet, because they were nomadic peoples, those tents were taken down and moved on and taken down and moved on. That's the illustration here. This isn't an anti-camping text. This is a make sure you know what you're living in. Isn't it true that what people call camping in our day sometimes is like a seventy or $80,000 RV that people pull with their $100,000 truck and back onto a nice pad and they plug it in and all the comforts of home are there. It's like, hey, let's go to the lake camping. That's not what Paul's talking about here. This, this kind of camping is what you and I have grown up with. And the longer you live, I put this in table talk this week, isn't it true that the longer you live, the more you understand the groaning that he talks about in this text? Or the closer you have been to somebody who really has groaning. And yes, it does happen to young people, doesn't it? Tents are not designed to be permanent, but houses aren't either. Teardown can be a, a, a drawn-out process as our bodies slowly decay. But you know what move-out is? Instantaneous. Teardown may take a while, but move-out is boom. That's what he's talking about here. Being absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Teardown may take a while, move-out is instantaneous. And the new dwelling is permanent. So he says, for indeed in this house, we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Some of my children uh, have picked up on the habit I have of sitting down in a chair and making noise while I'm sitting down in the chair. And the progressive commercials have made fun of us boomers as, as well. And uh, thankfully, I've known children who do this as well. You just, ugh, because they're, they're just things that hurt that don't used to hurt. The groaning is more, though, than just physical groaning, isn't it? I've spoken with a number of, of saints who, who ha have said, 
I know more people in heaven than I know on earth now. You come to a place where you have seen so much in this world of heartache, whether that would be sins or just death, people, people who have done horrible things, and it really helps you to understand that what we have here is really not all that great. Even while you think you are immortal and you think you can do anything, physically your body's at its peak and whether you can slam dunk or, or run a five-minute mile or, or whatever it is you, you can do that makes you think this is, this is really something. The day will come sooner or later because life is so short that you will need to hope in something that you know for sure. Because I'll tell you one thing you can't know, and that is how long this body is going to last without groaning. Indeed, in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. By the way, unbelievers groan as well. But as I pointed out earlier, they don't have any hope for a dwelling place. They are, they are leaping off the cliff into eternity blindfolded. But there is laid up for God's children new garments. New garments that never fade. And whatever the resurrection body looks like, we can say, well, it looks like Jesus' body. Well, we don't even know what that looks like other than recognizable, this resurrection body was. Uh, but eternal. Not a spiritual body in the sense that it, it can't be touched because the Lord Jesus ate food and he, remember he invited Thomas to, to touch the nail prints in his hand and the spear print in his side. Uh, remember Mary Magdalene clung to his feet. Physical resurrection is the hope in the long term for the people of God. In the short term, whatever, whatever that house we move into is, uh, it's, it's where we live until the resurrection happens. There is laid up for God's children new garments that never fade. And those garments are designed to last forever. Indeed, in this house we groan longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. In other words, we're not just disembodied spirits floating around somewhere in some limbo or purgatory place. That's, that's alien teaching from the Bible. What the Bible teaches is that when you leave your body, remember the, the and it isn't even a parable, people call it the story of the rich man and Lazarus a parable. Uh, Jesus didn't use names in parables. He was talking about two historic people, and they died it, probably during Jesus' earthly lifetime, and and one went to a place of torment, and one went to a place of bliss, so when he talks about being found naked, we're not found unclothed. We leave these tents and there's something for believers better. I want to make a contrast here because uh, this may very well be what Paul had in mind as he's writing this. You contrast this with the shame of Adam and Eve. Where did death begin? In the day you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. And you know, you've read your Bibles. Genesis 3 doesn't say Adam and Eve just thud, thud when they took the fruit. That, that wasn't the kind of death they experienced. But the death process began. They died spiritually. Separation, really the Bible is separation of three different ways when it describes death. There's physical death when you're separated from your body. There is spiritual death, meaning we're born dead in our trespasses and sins and we're separated from God relationally. And then there's eternal death, the Bible speaks about, where we are separated from God eternally. What happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve took the fruit God told them not to eat and when the death process began? For the first time, shame. And they had to hide themselves. Wait a minute. What are you wearing? It wasn't an issue before that time. They had shame and they're hiding from God and so they're separated relationally from God for the first time. Isn't this what he's talking about? When death began in the human race, it resulted in shame and awareness that we're not clothed. And of course, God clothed them. They, they did their best. God took the life of an animal and clothed them. Our ultimate end 
and greatest joy comes after we die, not while we're living. Adam and Eve experienced shame after their sin, and God is in the business of removing shame by clothing His own with the righteousness of Christ. Jesus taught this, by the way, in, in John's Gospel. Listen to this. As He's talking about death, He's talking to His disciples uh, on the night before He was crucified. He's talking to His disciples, or the day before. He's talking to them about their death. And remember, uh, of all of them, uh, the ones who followed him, the 11 who followed him, would have martyrs' deaths with the possible exception of John who was writing these things down. And the Lord Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. Point, Jesus, what are you trying to say? There, there is a good end that comes even with the curse of sin that brought death, there, there really is no final purpose lived out until we leave this sin-cursed world. So he compares us to a seed. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. You have to plant a seed. It has to die in order to bring out what it was designed to bring out. And then Jesus said, he who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. That's not talking about self-abuse, whipping yourself. That's saying there's something better. Honestly, friends, if you have to read a book to get your best life now, there's something you're missing. If your best life is now, that means there's not a good eternity awaiting you. There's something so much better that Jesus has planned for His own people. And so in verse 4, He says, For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Just think about the burdens that you have in this world. I mean, when you're honest... When you're honest, and we learn how to put on a show, don't we? We want to look a certain way. We want to fit in with the culture. That's a, that is just a, a natural part of us. It's not all evil. However, when we're honest, we've got to be honest about our doubts, about our sins, about what we experience in this world. And before God right now, think about the burdens of sin and shame and hurt that you have caused or hurt that you've experienced, hardship. Think about all of those things that we endure in this world. Let me give you hope, believer. Those aren't going to last long. Those are not going to last long. Mortality must give way to our eternal home. Look at the way he describes it. We do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. And those words swallowed up actually come from one word that's two words packed together in the original. It literally means to drink down. To drink down. It was actually used in the New Testament of eating and drinking, obviously. So literal eating and drinking uh, in the passive forms. But it's actually used of being eaten and even being drowned being swallowed up. But, but look at the picture in this text. What's going to be swallowed up? Mortality. M mortality means that you're dying. You're compost. You're on your way out. From the point of conception, the truth is you're on your way out. And we do our dead level best to, to make the tent look good and to, to communicate to others, some of us, that this thing's here for good. But he's saying that mortality is, is going to be swallowed up in a sea of life. Uh, this is what Paul told this same church, 1 Corinthians 15, what we call the resurrection chapter. He applied this same word to Christ's victory over death, the swallowed up word uh, in the resurrection chapter. To the same church he said, but when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, 
then will come about the saying that is written, and he, he borrowed this from the Old Testament scriptures, death is swallowed up in victory. Mortality or death is going to be no more. It's going to be gone. And then he says in verse 5, to end this section, and believe me, there's, there's more good stuff coming. Chapter 5 is, is such a sweet chapter when it comes to God saying, you guys have hope. So much more than what you're experiencing here. There's comfort for you. This isn't about how you feel. This is about what you know. And so in confidence and faith, Paul writes, now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. God prepared us. That word, by the way, is almost, I look through all the uses in the New Testament. It's used in a, a, a diverse number a diverse number of scriptures but frequently most frequently it's used of producing something or or performance for instance like a, a chef prepares a meal the preparation has an end in mind the meal is prepared all of the work that goes in it is just so it will be consumed so it will be savored so it will be enjoyed so how do i fulfill god's purpose God prepared us with a purpose in mind that we would be with Him. God did not prepare us so we could just have lots of stuff here and live as what some people call the head and not the tail. It, it isn't about all the stuff we can collect and gather in this world. There's something better. We fulfill God's purpose ultimately in the end when we go to be with Him. And how do we know we're going to go be with Him? There's a confidence that he gives his people because he's given his spirit. His promises and his pledge guarantee that the saints will one day be with Jesus. Now, how do you know you have the Holy Spirit? And some of our friends would say, well, you're going to manifest these outward things, but you know those things can be faked. The work of the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin and righteousness and judgment. The work of the Holy Spirit puts fruit into you that changes you. The work of the Holy Spirit brings you under control of God so you are behaving as if Jesus were standing right beside you right now. That's the way Peter behaved when he was filled with the Spirit. The Spirit is God's pledge, earnest money, down payment, and it guarantees that God is going to be back to complete the transaction and trying to move a lot of property in the last couple of years that, that we had to sell. I liked it when somebody came and said, I'm really interested in this and I'm going to be back here. And, and they give me money. Say, I'll go get the rest of it. Not the people who say, yeah, can you hang on to that for me for a few days? God will be back to complete the transaction. That's why the Spirit in more than one place is called the earnest of our inheritance. The pledge, the promise. God made a promise. God made a pledge. The Spirit is God's earnest money that guarantees He's going to be back to complete the transaction. C.S. Lewis in uh, Mere Christianity, which is one of my favorite books I, I've read and uh, you're not going to agree with everything you read in, in C.S. Lewis. But he was a man who was genuinely converted, having been an atheist to faith in Christ. A man who was a materialist who just for a long time in his life thought all that there is in this world is what we can measure. Yet as a philosopher and a Bible student, I, I wouldn't necessarily call him a theologian, but, but some would. And you read Mere Christianity, you, you certainly get the depth of this man's walk with God. But this quote, and, and it is often misquoted, but this is the, the direct lift from mere Christianity. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Truth. That is true. So there's purpose in this existence, even when it's hard. And the purpose is not to get all the people and all the stuff in your life just gathered around you so, so everybody's performing the way you want them to. Because you'll never get that. Even if you get parts of that, you will never have life by the tail in a sin-cursed world. 
What you can have, though, is hope, is purpose, God's purpose. That is why the, the first question and answer of the Westminster Shorter Catechism is, what is man's primary purpose, or what is the chief end of man in the older version? Your primary purpose is, is to glorify God and enjoy Him, not circumstances, forever. Sometimes I glorify God most in the middle of suffering. Wouldn't it be a great goal to die like a Christian? To be able to finish your course with joy when, when you realize, I have in, in my last breaths in this world a hope that is so much better than anything I've ever had in this world. To be able to say with Paul, I have fought the good fight, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith. This is where Paul is calling the Corinthians to a different life, even if it's short. The reason you can live with this great purpose is because even a long life is short next to eternity. That's what Paul said back in chapter 4, that our trials were short were momentary, they were lightweight compared to the weight of glory that, that waits for the people of God in eternity. Even a long life is short next to eternity. And, and praise the Lord if He gives us a long life, a longer life to bring Him glory here, a longer life to bring more people to worship at the throne. But ultimately, that's His call, not yours and mine. Life is Short. I don't think I even need to come up with an illustration for that because you realize that. And, and the wheel just seems to spin faster and fa faster and faster and faster the older you get. Here's a, another reason why you can have this purpose, though. You were designed for a better home. You were designed for a better home. What we have here isn't worth staying in. The same guy, Paul, wrote to the church at Philippi. This church that, I mean, what did he have when that church started? What, what were the church members? Basically, what we know from the scriptures in Acts chapter 16, you had a little girl who had just been demon-possessed. You had a jailer who was just trying to take his own life because he thought he had nothing to live for because he thought some of the people had escaped. You, you had a, a, a business lady. There weren't even enough Jewish men to start a synagogue in Philippi. That's what you had in Philippi. And yet, what hope did Paul give that church? He said in Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there who will transform our lowly bodies. This was the hope that he had for these people who maybe in this world's terms were just a tiny little church in a, a, an economically depressed area. And he gave them hope that they were designed for a better home. That's why you can live with purpose. To realize not, well, this, this life is just one big bummer. It isn't that way at all. It's to say, I'm going to enjoy what God's given me, but I know that there's something even better. You will hear if, if you come to the, the spring banquet uh, this coming Saturday night with the teens, you will hear something, a, a statement by a, a young missionary who went to heaven as a very, very young man. I think he was in his late 20s. Jim Elliott, uh, while he was in college, wrote these words. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. What if God called all of us here today to martyrdom? That he was going to call us to preach the gospel in a place here or abroad where to to share our faith in Christ was going to cost us our lives. Would that be a waste? Paul's saying, you were designed for something better than this anyway. This life is so short next to eternity, there's something better. And finally, we'll say this, because we believe God's word uh, as a church officially, and hopefully that's you individually, because God is better than you and me at, at defining what our purpose is. If your primary purpose is to live your best life now, then there is no end to the selfish pursuits that will logically follow. But God has better joy. He has better ends in mind than you can possibly conceive. 
as Paul wrote in another place, eye has not seen, neither ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. That, that starts out here, not just heaven. There's something special that God has for his own, but it's only found when you find your identity and your purpose in Jesus. So if I end this message by saying, how y'all feel? I, I'm, I'm pleased if, if the feelings that are good that are coming out of this because there's a confidence in God's word. But even if there isn't a whole lot of hope of what's, what's going on after today, a lot of hope in being recognized in your job or having your spouse suddenly become entirely sanctified. If that isn't what's probably going to happen in your life, there's a joy that comes out of this because you know that if this tent that you're in isn't properly honored the way you think it ought to be honored by those who live outside it, if you realize more and more of this thing's starting to fall down, there's something sweet in living out a purpose in a shortened life. Let's pray. Father, we so want you to bring this gospel message home to those who are hearing it uh, who really have no assurance of the life Paul's talking about here. So I pray first of all for those who are on the outside that gospel hope would come to them uh, because your word has been preached. But we know gospel hope is for the church as well. Paul wrote these words to the saints. And so for us who have so often fallen prey to living uh, based on momentary emotions, based on circumstances, and thinking our level of joy is all about getting things in our life in order. Thank you that you've shown us your control, your personal love for us, that you want us to be clothed with joy and not with shame. So bring us to find that purpose in you. In Jesus' name, amen. There are so many hymns about the faithfulness of God, about him never failing. Uh, these are songs that as a young person I was challenged to sing when, when tempted to sin. He never fails. He is faithful. He won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But when you do sin, he's faithful and just and forgives your sins if you confess them. This is hope for you and me. Let's sing this.
just a few announcements before you're dismissed. Uh, we'll have a little bit of fellowship time, and then Sunday school will start shortly after the bell rings. We do have a, a class in here. We're actually finishing off our series on the, the kings of Israel and Judah. So uh, adults and parents, if you want to keep your kids with you, that's fine. But we do have graded classes meeting down the back hallway, and teens will be meeting in the, the furnace. So uh, we would welcome you to stick around for that. Uh, one important announcement this week is that on uh, Saturday night, it is Saturday night, it's the banquet, right? Uh, the teens have a banquet Saturday night, and uh, there's a, a sign-up sheet in the foyer. We sure would like it if all of you could come. The costs are, are written down there for a meal, and um, there will be some music and some other things. But uh, really, the, the highlight of that event will be Bridge of Blood, the, uh, the drama about Jim Elliott and four other missionaries who were martyred and their wives who were left behind in Ecuador to um, make this bridge to the people who killed their husbands. So really uh, quite an effective story, a, a serious drama, and yet uh, one that will, will keep you listening and watching. So I hope you're able to come and be a part of that next Saturday. Again, all the details are at the Welcome Center, and uh, the teens would need you to sign up for that as soon as possible so they can prepare food for that event. Let me leave you with a benediction today from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. You're dismissed. <laughs>